Okay. Um, so uh, this is a lecture. It's, it's you know, we all cover uh, liver and spleen sort of as we're doing the fast exam and gallbladders and kind of looking at kidneys, but this is, this is stuff that's a little bit outside of that. So we're gonna look at some liver abnormalities and some spleen abnormalities. And we'll talk about the normal characteristics of those organs as well. So uh, that was supposed to be my intro slide. Um, conflict of interest, I have none. If anybody wants to pay me a lot of money, I would be happy to take it. So our objectives basically are to recognize the normal sonographic appearance of the liver and also of the spleen, and then some of the abnormal findings and kind of come up with a limited differential diagnosis for those. So a little bit of liver anatomy, and no, I'm not going to make you learn all of the nine segments, um, but there are some kind of important um, things you want to know. On the left side, we have the front liver surface, and you can see the gallbladder below. You can also see that it's divided into right lobe and left lobe by the falciform ligament and then the round ligament um, actually coming below the, the liver. Um, the right lobe is divided into an anterior and a posterior segment, and the left lobe is divided into a medial and a lateral segment. Um, and those are done because of the vasculature flow, particularly of the portal system. And then underneath the gallbladder, um, we have a couple of fossae for uh, the kidney and for the colon. We also have for the gallbladder, and you'll notice the falciform ligament, and you can actually see it as it can help you help guide you, um, you know, right to the gallbladder. And very important is the circulation for the gallbladder. So you notice that you have the portal triad and that's containing the hepatic arteries and the um, common bile duct and also the portal veins. And those all travel together. And then we also have the hepatic veins and those actually, so anatomically they split the liver, um, the liver segments. So the, the right vein is going to split the anterior and posterior segments. And then the middle vein actually comes between the, the two, um, the two segments or the two lobes. And then the left one is going to uh, separate the anterior and posterior, sorry, the lateral and medial parts of the left lobe of the liver. And then the portal triads go um, go into the liver, into each of the segments. So how does the liver look? Well, it's pretty homogeneous, right? There's not a lot of difference. And you can see it's broken up a little bit by the portal triads, um, particularly the portal veins are visible because they have those fatty collars around them. So you can see portal vein, and then you can see some of the portal veins running within the liver. Um, and also some of the hepatic veins, which do not have a nice collar around them. And of course, if you follow those, they will lead you directly to the IVC. And how about the echogenicity of the liver? It should be about as echogenic as the kidney. So they should be very close to each other. It's going to be less echogenic than the spleen. Um, and we'll, when we start looking at the spleen, we'll be able to compare those two. So it's homogeneous, it's pretty smooth. And as we said, the echogenicity is um, going to be uh, greater than or equal to the right kidney. And usually it seems to be about the same. And then it'll be hypoechoic compared to the spleen and also the pancreas. And how big should it be? Because you kind of want to have some knowledge of dimensions. And this is where we're measuring the liver. And actually you're going to find the mid clavicular line and Kind of draw that down on the body and that's where you're going to measure the liver dimension and normal liver it's going to be about less than 16 centimeters and some places i've seen 17 some places i'm i've seen 15 so i'm just going with with the ballpark in the middle and again measured in the mid clavicular line so hepatomegaly basically if you have if it exceeds the dimensions, if you have extension beyond the lower pole of the kidney where it actually rounds, goes around that lower tip of the kidney, 
And then of course, if you have extension of the left lobe into the left upper quadrant over the spleen. And then there's a phenomenon though, it's called the Rydell's lobe. And this is a normal variant and it's not considered hepatomegaly. So it's an extension of the right lobe of the liver. And you'll notice it doesn't really hug or go around the kidney, but it just kind of keeps on going down into the pelvis. And these can go all the way down to the iliac crest, um, as you can see in the example on the CT. And in fact, if you trace the ultrasound one, you would, you would uh, um, actually be able to find the iliac crest as well. And that's called a Rydell's lobe. It's fairly uncommon, uh, but it's not considered to be hepatomegaly. So again, nice homogeneous, um, nice homogeneous appearance of the liver. Uh, you can sort of see the portal veins, the portal triad cursing through there. And take a look at this liver for comparison. And what do you notice? Well, you notice there's a lot of tubes. I'm seeing way more tubes than I should. And some of them are aligned in this nice, this nice pattern where they're lined up like they're probably part of the portal triad. And just clipping through, you can see lots of tubes. There's just more than there should be. And how do I know what these tubes are? I can put some color on them. So um, you can actually show that there's no flow. And in the lower right, you can see the calipers measuring the tube without any flow, which would be the the um, duct, the interhepatic duct, and then just below that you can see, you can't see the portal vein very well, but you can actually see that there's flow in it. So I know that that's actually, actually intrahepatic duct dilatation. The other thing to notice is that the ducts will often come together centrally. They have this like a stellate pattern, which you can see in this, this clip, how they come together and then they seem to radiate. Well, they're actually, they're, they're coming together into the center of the star. So if they're bigger than two millimeters in diameter, that would be a dilated intrahepatic duct. And the ones on that, that uh, image with the color actually were almost four millimeters or if they're greater than 40% of the diameter of the adjacent portal vein. So if they're about half as big, normally you can't even see these. So, nor so if they're about half as big as the adjacent portal vein, you should think that they're, they're, um, they're dilated. And they usually will have this stellate configuration. So the center of the star um, will, be, will be sort of going towards the porta hepatis, and then they'll be branching out from that. And also a lack of Doppler signal, which tells you that it's not actually, it's not, not a vein, it's not artery, but it's actually the intrahepatic duct. So the etiologies of this, you know, it could be cholodogolithiasis that's causing this. Um, and maybe you'll even be able to find the stone in the common bile duct. It can also be a stricture or a mass, and there's two types of masses. It can be one that's inside the ductal system and then one that's outside and compressing on them. And the truth is that ultrasound is not the best way to figure out why the intrahepatic ducts are dilated. So then you're gonna need to move on to further imaging. So we have a 55 year old male, he's hypotensive, he's altered, he's got a really uh, tender abdomen. And so of course, we're gonna take a scan and figure out what else is going on. We don't know who he is. We don't have an ID, we don't have anything. Um, and uh, so you're looking at this and you're looking at the liver and you notice immediately a couple things. You notice that there's some free fluid, inferior aspect of the liver anteriorly. And you also notice that there are these small hyperechoic foci in the liver, which isn't really normal. They're very small, they have dirty shadowing. And if you're thinking, wow, where have I seen that before? And you're thinking, oh, in the lungs or maybe in the bowel, but no, this is air in the liver. Probably not a good thing. So the question is, where is that air? So it could be in the biliary tree, right? Could be pneumobilia could also be portal vein air, not a really good sign. And then it could be air in the hepatic veins. So we're actually gonna figure out how we can tell the difference between these guys. 
So pneumobilia, and I think of the causes of this. So it's typically some connection between the GI tract and the biliary tree. So the gas from within the GI tract is getting into the biliary tree. So anybody who's had an ERCP um, or you know something else done uh, uh, similar to that is probably going to have some pneumobilia. And that would be considered kind of a normal finding. If they have an incompetent sphincter of OD, I really like this. The books refer to this as an incompetent sphincter. And I don't know of any other anatomical organ that we call incompetent. It sort of makes me think that it it's, has you know some sentiments to it and it's it's able to think on its own. Everything else is, is dysfunctional, but no, the sphincter of OD is incompetent. But regardless, that will give you air in your biliary tree. And then of course, anytime there's been a surgical biliary enteric anastomosis, think about a Whipple procedure um, where they're, they're um, really anastomosing the, the uh, gallbladder right to the, right to the intestines. Or you can get a spontaneous biliary enteric fistula. So if you have a gallbladder that erodes right through into your, into your bowel, um, you can actually get nice, a nice spontaneous uh, biliary enteric fistula. Or if you have a perforated uh, duodenal also, or ulcer because of the proximity to the biliary tree or the common bile duct, you can actually get a nice fistula there. And infection will rarely cause air in the biliary tree. So this is exa an example of air in the biliary tree. And I want you to just, just kind of look at the location of that air. And then we're gonna compare it to our, our current patient. So um, that's air in the biliary tree. And then portal venous gas. So what causes this? Alterations in the bowel wall. So if you start to have um, bad things happening um, like an ischemic gut and there's bacteria with gas forming organisms within the bowel wall, not so good. Um, that gas is going to wind up in the, uh, the hepatic uh, or I should say the portal circulation. So if you have bowel luminal distension, somehow this can cause it. If you have sepsis, that can cause it. And you can also just get portal venous gas from unknown reasons. And so this is our patient um, with the the, um, the uh, air that we're seeing and some free fluid as well. And notice that that air is kind of peripherally located as opposed to this air, which is more centrally located. And our friends at uh, Radiopedia have come up with a little acronym for this. The portal venous gas is going to be more peripheral and the common bile duct gas is going to be more central. So that should help you remember the, the patterns of, of, uh, of uh, air in the various vessels. Now, hepatic venous gas is also possible. This is usually associated with something like a femoral central line where you're going to be pushing medications through it and saline and you may get some air in there. Um, and typically these air bubbles will move in with the pulse. So you'll see the heartbeat and you'll actually see the, um, the air in these vessels move because uh, you're getting movement of the blood in the vein. And so the air is gonna move just along with the pulse. So right along with the heartbeat. So hepatis venous gas, often associated with femoral vein cannulation, cannulation and giving um, IV fluids. And then it will move rhythmically with the heartbeat. Okay, another case, 60 year old male, altered mental status, hypotensive, diffuse abdominal tenderness. Um, oh, and our first patient actually had uh, an ischemic gut and that was causing the portal venous gas. So our new patient now, we decide to take a look at the abdomen, look at the gallbladder and uh, look at the liver. And uh, we see that the liver is really not homogeneous. It, looks kind of ratty. It's just got a nasty looking texture to it. And we also kind of notice that the edges of the liver aren't really smooth either. They seem to be kind of nodular. So if you have diffuse inhomogeneity, it's often cirrhosis. It can be fatty infiltrate, but it can also be metastatic disease. 
Um, so you'll notice that metastatic disease or uh, tumors will come up in almost every one of our discussion areas, whether they're solid, whether it's a cystic lesion. So I want you to keep that in mind that the cancer is always in uh, the differential. Some uncommon causes of diffuse inhomogeneity are hepatocellular carcinoma. You can have a fibrotic liver or you can get lymphoma that may look like that. I wanna talk a little bit about fatty infiltrate. So on the left, you have a normal liver and then you have um, fatty infiltrate, which on ultrasound is going to look hyperechoic. And then you start to get areas of fibrosis or cirrhosis. And then when you actually have full-blown liver cirrhosis, you'll see that it's nodular, um, it's really fibrotic, and uh, the liver surface itself is not smooth and lots of fatty infiltrate in there. So cirrhosis, just some examples. Uh, you can see in the top left, there's some ascites there. And then you can see that the liver is really kind of nodular and its appearance is, is um, inhomogeneous. Another example on the upper right of nodular liver with the ascites. Um, and then uh, again, in the bottom you can image, you can see that. So inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous and nodular appearing. So this is an example of fatty liver or hepatic fat infiltration. And the one on the upper left, it's kind of general. And you'll notice that it's just hyperechoic. Notice how hypoechoic the kidney is to the liver. And normally those two should be about the same. Interesting about, thing about fatty infiltrate is that you can have areas of sparing or you can have areas of focal fat infiltration. So on the upper right, you can see that there's an area of normal liver tissue. And then in the one on the bottom, you can see that there's actually an area of fatty infiltrate. And these typically, these areas, whether it's sparing or whether it's infiltrate are often around like the porta hepatis or the falciform ligament. Um, they're kind of typically in that, that neighborhood. Another example of a really fatty liver, and you can see that there's a couple areas of sparing right next to the gallbladder, another common place for this to happen. You'll also notice that it's really hard to see the structures. It's hard to make out the gallbladder. It's really hard to, to make out the vascular structures and the, the porta hepatis, the portal triads, because the, um, the fatty nature of the tissue, uh, you know, the speed of sound changes and it's really difficult to actually see beyond it. So fatty infiltrate, typically hyperechoic, hard to see the normal structures, and you can have focal areas of infiltrate or sparing. Typically in the gallbladder fossa near the falciform ligament, the porta hepatis, and um, these areas usually have poor margins and note that they don't cause any mass effect. They're just there as part of the liver. And moving along to yet another patient, 42-year-old female MVC, of course, we're doing a fast exam, we're taking a look at the liver, and we're kind of looking at the supradiaphragmatic space, and we're scanning through, and we're like, wait a minute, wait, 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 what's, what's that? Um, doesn't really look like a liver lesion caused by trauma, um, but there's definitely a nice round structure there. It's got good borders, and you notice that there's also nice uh, through transmission or posterior enhancement behind the structure. Um, this is another case, some cysts. This is a 34-year-old female with hematuria. And you start to take a look and you look at the kidneys and you look at the liver and you see there's multiple cysts and they're all kind of nice and round or oval. They all have this um, the posterior enhancement. So this would be polycystic kidney disease. And sometimes you may see that there's actually debris or sludge appearing stuff inside one of these cysts and typically in the kidney. And that would be somebody who comes in with hematuria because they, this, one of these cysts has become hemorrhagic. So simple cystic liver lesions, typically round and oval, anechoic, no septations, and then they have that enhanced through transmission. 62-year-old male, six weeks of right upper quadrant pain, now he's febrile, got a white count. LFTs are normal, except his ELK-FOS is up. So of course, we're gonna take a look. 
and you're scanning through the liver and you're like, okay, wait, what is this? It's pretty round, but it has some echoes in it. Uh, I know he's febrile, so I'm going to make a wild guess and say that's a hepatic abscess, and it is. So if it looked like this, you might be thinking, wow, there's a whole bunch of kind of little baby cysts in there, and perhaps this is a hydatid cyst. And this is actually, so it's it's the echinococcus that's uh, left these, these uh, lovely um, baby tapeworms uh, that are going to come out. And you'll, you'll notice that this actually, if you look this up, it has different stages to it. So initially, um, it will just kind of look like a hypo or anechoic region, and then it's going to get these cysts, and then it actually um, will have this long tapeworm looking thing in it. Um, so that's uh, echinococcus disease, and that can happen in other places as well, but the liver is very common, and not something that we commonly see in the US. So complex cystic lesions, septations, internal echoes, maybe they will have enhanced through transmission, but, but uh, not typically. So cystic liver lesions, where do they come from? Well, of course, things being common that are common, cysts are the most common cause. Uncommon things, abscesses, you can have a hematoma, you can have cystic mets. Again, notice that cancer is in there. Um, and then the echinococcus and also a biloma. This could be an aneurysm or an AV fistula or a hemorrhagic adenoma um, or biliary uh, carcinoma. So make sure you throw some color on it if you're thinking that it might be a vascular process. Okay, so back to our MVC patient. And you notice I kind of cut that clip off pretty quickly because as you're going through it, you're like, wait, 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 wait. There's other stuff in there. Whoa, wait, what's all this stuff? So that stuff is actually um, hyperechoic lesions within the liver. So we had the anechoic and now we're moving on to the hyperechoic. So on our CT, we have our nice anechoic cyst. And then we have this other lesion. And you'll notice that this lesion is actually hypoechoic or hypodense on CT whereas on ultrasound, it was hyperechoic. So solid liver lesions, which is what we're looking at, the most common is going to be a hemangioma. A hemangioma. And these are typically, they're the most common benign cysts. They're hypodense on CT, but hyperechoic on ultrasound. They're usually homogeneous. They're usually less than three centimeters. Um, but if they're larger, they're often they can be atypical looking. And again, the exact cause may be better delineated by a different imaging modality. So this is an example of several hemangiomas. They're nice and small, um, they're hyperechoic, and they're, they're, you know, they don't really disrupt the liver. Um, they don't cause a mass effect. They're just kind of there. So this is a patient who was placed in our clinical decision uni unit with chest pain, epigastric pain, wasn't really clear, thought I would take a look at the gallbladder and the gallbladder on this ultrasound was actually pretty normal. But sweeping through, you can see anterior to the gallbladder or superior on this image, you can see that there's this kind of uh, ratty looking area that it's like there's a mass there and it's not really hyperechoic, it's kind of mixed. And on transverse, the same thing, like this area in here, it just doesn't look right. And so I actually took this over to our radiologist. I printed out paper images and I said, um, what do you think this is? And how do I image it next? And he said, well, it's either a good OMA or a bad OMA. So <laughs> either a hemangioma or a hepatocellular car carcinoma. Um, and he said, you want to get CT imaging with, with uh, delayed, delayed images. And if it fills up um, then with uh, contrast, then you can be pretty sure that it's actually a hemangioma, which actually turned out to be the case, much to the patient's happiness and mine as well. So the atypical hemangiomas, you might think that they're actually cancer, and you're going to get the CT contrast with delayed imaging to see if that hemangioma fills up. So this is another solid lesion. It's an adenoma. 
And these are not very common. They're most commonly seen in young women who are using birth control, particularly when we had the higher doses of the birth control. Not exactly clear what causes this, but you can see it kind of has an irregular border. And these, if you identify one, they can be problematic because they often hemorrhage. Um, so, so this is something that you probably wanna do something with and make sure that, um, that Perhaps the surgeons um, are aware of it. Uh, it might be IR who's gonna who might deal with it, or you might just send the patient home, but tell them that this has a high risk of of um, actually bleeding. So solid lesions, hemangiomas, by far and away the most common. And then you can have these other benign tumors. And I don't have an image of focal nodular hyperplasia because it can actually be difficult to see by ultrasound because it kind of looks like a normal, um, the liver texture looks normal, um, but it's actually an area that's become hyper, hyperplasic, hyperplastic um, around, uh, um, around uh, some extra vascularity. And often we won't even see that on ultrasound. So metastatic disease also can be a solid lesion. And again, you're probably gonna want to go to some other imaging study. Just how urgently is how strongly you feel it's something bad. So here's another lovely liver. And you'll notice that there's some free fluid around this liver. And you also notice that it's not really homogeneous and it has these lesions in it. Um, and I'll, I'll do this clip because there's one really nice one at the end. So you can see there's a target lesion within the liver. And target lesions are most commonly going to be cancer. So they're metastatic or they're HCC. Uncommon, it can be a, a lymph node. It can be that focal nodular hyperplasia. You can also see this with a fungal abscess and sometimes the adenomas will appear this way as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about malignant tumors. So the most common tumor in the liver is actually going to be metastatic. More than half the people who are dying from cancer have mets to the, their liver, and many cancers metastasize to the liver. Um, if you just think about all of the blood flow from um, the GI tract that's going there, so everything's going to metastasize to the liver. And then the next most common is primary hepatocellular carcinoma, um, and all of these have a really uh, variable ultrasound appearance. So this is mets. Um, un, unknown primary, but you can see there's kind of target lesions um, and there's a, a lot of mets in there. They're all kind of clumping together. This is a colon cancer that has metastasized and you can actually see um, with some of these cancer, if cancers, if you put color on them, that they're really kind of hypervascular uh, because they're, they're, um, they're happily growing away inside the liver. This is an example of metastatic disease from a lung cancer. Um, and you can see this is just really diffusely inhomogeneous and it's got um, you know, kind of lobulations. It's pushing away the normal liver, um, the normal liver tissue there. And again, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is typical appearance, irregular borders, areas of mixed echogenicity, and again, you can really uh, see the um, hypervascularity when you put some color on these. So liver lesions, take home points, most of them require additional imaging. And if you have prior imaging, go look at the results. So if you're scanning and you see a lesion and you measure it and you go back and five years ago on ultrasound or on CT, they had the exact same images, the exact same lesions, they, and they haven't grown significantly, um, then you're I'm pretty safe saying that this is, this is, you know, was seen five years before, and you probably don't need to pursue additional imaging. So the liver, basically normal, is homogeneous, less than 16 centimeters. It's going to be about the same echogenicity as the kidney and it's going to be hypoechoic compared to the spleen and the pancreas. The ducts typically two millimeters or less, and of course, um, you should not have air in the liver. That's not a good thing, no air in the liver. Um, so the things that can cause diffuse inhomogeneity, common things, cirrhosis, metastatic disease, fatty infiltrate, 
The uncommon would be hepatocellular carcinoma, fibrosis, or lymphoma. And then the cystic lesions, of course, the common thing is cysts. Um, and uncommon would be these other etiologies, uh, abscess, might be a hematoma, um, could be that nice kinococcus. Please send me those images if you, if you get them. And then rare would be an aneurysm or an AV fistula um, or a hem hemorrhagic adenoma. So solid lesions most commonly are hemangiomas. They might be adenomas. Those are typically going to be larger, not have as well-rounded borders, not as definitive, and typically in young women who are using birth control. And some of the other benign or malignant tumors can also look solid. If you happen to see target lesions, especially multiple ones, that's probably cancer. It's probably a metastatic disease, but it might be primary HCC. Could also be lymphoma, um, hyperplasia, fungal abscesses, or adenomas. Okay, so now for something completely different. Well, it's not completely different, but it's on the other side of the body. So we're going to talk about the spleen. So anatomy of the spleen, it's got this nice little capsule around it. Um, and you can see that there's, there's um, places for the colon, a nice little recess there, a nice little place for the stomach. Um, and then you can see it has the vessels that are going into it. So the, hip, the splenic artery and the splenic vein. And then of course they branch off into the different areas of the spleen. Um, and and uh, also the, um, the gastroepiploic vessels come off just before it goes into the spleen. Um, so lots of vascularity there, which is why if you injure your spleen, um, particularly if you injure your splenic artery, things generally don't go so well. So just clip through the spleen and you can see it's hyperechoic when compared to the kidney. And you can see the splenic hilum there with the vessels. And if you put flow on those, you can usually find the vessels pretty well. And you may have to have them hold their breath, but you can see, um, and if you played around more with the um, color Doppler, you can probably uh, get a better impression of, of uh, directionality and which is venous and which is arterial. So the spleen, homogeneous, it really doesn't have the vessels running through the actual um, you know, body of the spleen like the liver does. You don't see the portal triad. Um, you don't see the hepatic veins. And typically it's going to be more echogenic than the liver or the kidney and about the same as the pancreas. And it looks like a crescent. Well, how sh big should this thing be? So your typical spleen, you know, everybody kind of has a good idea. I mean, you're all saying, yeah, that spleen is too big. But what is a normal spleen and how do I measure it? So typically you're going to measure in the, the longitudinal or the, the sagittal um, in the largest dimension that you can find. And then we're also going to do um, right at the hilum. So you're gonna go from the, the splenic border um, laterally to the hilum medially. And so here's an example of normal spleen. So about seven centimeters in length and about uh, three centimeters across. So typically they should be less than 13 centimeters and less than six centimeters in depth. So the length um, less than 13, I think I called mine less than six uh, centimeters in, um, in the short axis, but here they're calling it depth. So this spleen you can see is about 14 centimeters. And you also notice the ascites and that's because um, liver cirrhosis or anything that causes increased, um, increased uh, uh, portal venous congestion will also cause you to have some nice splenomegaly. This is an example from splenomegaly from um, infiltration with lymphocytes. So this is somebody with CLL. And you can see that the entire spleen is, is pretty well infiltrated and it's actually smooshing the kidney because it's so large. And then back to this image, which I keep going back to, and I'm sure some of you are jumping up and down and saying, wait, 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 there's some free fluid at the inferior pole of this spleen. And the spleen is really big. And if you're paying close attention, you're also saying, mm, you know, actually, 
it's not quite homogeneous, particularly when I look at the outer capsule. And you would be right, um, because sometimes you can actually have um, isoechoic hematomas, which may mimic, mimic splenomegaly. So common, CHF, portal hypertension, uh, leukemia or lymphoma, anything that infiltrates the spleen. Um, hepatitis can cause this. Mono would be the big one. That's why we don't let 13-year-olds go back and play football when they've um, been diagnosed with mononucleosis and some of the other infections, as well as a hemolytic anemia, because the spleen is going to be sequestering all of those red blood cells. So that's, again, this is an example of a hypo um, or an echo dense or echo, echo neutral um, hematoma. So there's a little free fluid, and then you can actually see um, the spleen looks huge, but that's actually because there's a subcapsular hematoma. Okay, so now let's talk about some splenic lesions. So you can see our spleen, and you can see the hilum, and then you can see these little globular structures that really look like splenic tissue. And that's because they are splenic tissue. So you can have a few, a few different um, causes for extra splenic tissue. You can have a splenule, which is also called an accessory spleen, a splenunculus, or a supernumerary spleen. And this is basically tissue outside the spleen. They're usually pretty small. They're usually kind of round shape. They can be congenital, but they're often as the result of trauma. Um, so if somebody's had splenic trauma, your, their spleen may actually create some, some uh, splenules. And they're more common with splen splenomegaly. You can also have something called splenosis. These are usually post-traumatic, and they can even occur if you've taken the spleen out. And it's, it's basically implantation of splenic tissue on the peritoneum. And it can kind of be a diagnostic dilemma because they can look like metastatic disease to the peritoneum. But someone who's had, had uh, um, tra trauma to their spleen, um, even if they've lost their, their spleen, there are probably some splenic cells still running around in there and they will actually implant on the peritoneum and give you some, some, uh, living, spleen, some living spleen tissue. I'm not sure how functional it is, but um, it's, it's splenic tissue. Okay, so on to some other lesions. So we have our nice cystic lesion in the spleen. And again, we can see these was part of polycystic kidney disease. So again, our kidneys, this is from the same patient we saw earlier, the kidneys have lots of cysts in them. And then the spleen also has uh, polycystic disease. So cysts, they can be post-traumatic, they can be post-infection, they can be post-infarct. So if part of your spleen has died, it can leave an area that's anechoic. If you've had an infection um, that can also kill off some spleen and leave you with a nice anechoic cyst, polycystic kid kidney disease. So cysts, congenital cysts in the spleen are much more rare than they are in the liver. Um, and then parasitic or vascular mimics. So again, put some ultrasound on because you really don't want to miss a splenic aneurysm. That would be a bad idea. So solid lesions, and this is kind of a big gnarly looking lesion and it's got lots of vascular flow. So I'd be worried about something that's perhaps uh, a tumor there. Um, and in fact, solid splenic lesions can be a whole lot of things. So they might be hemangiomas, they might be hamartomas, which is a different tissue in the, the spleen. They could be lymphomas, they could be dead, dead splenic uh, tissue. It could be mets, abscesses, sarcoidosis, lots of things. So um, this is an example of a solid lesion. It's near the, it's near the hilum and you can kind of see it coming in and out and you see it right at the end of the, the video clip. And I'd love to be able to tell you what this was, but the patient never followed up. And so I don't really know, but it's a nice hyperechoic solid lesion. And this is a patient who um, was getting a FAST exam and uh, FAST looks okay, but there's all of these really hyperechoic foci within the kidney, um, sorry, within the spleen. 
And actually on CT, you could see, yes, they're there too. And there's even a couple in the liver. And these guys can actually be caused, they're most usually caused by a fungal infection. So if this is an HIV patient, you might thinking, be thinking about something like toxo um, or histo or one of those things. And in fact, in the normal population, histo uh, plasmosis is a pretty benign infection. And you know, if you happen to live in the Ohio River Valley area, it's, um, it's fairly common and it can cause you to have these nice little granulomas, um, which uh, this, in this trauma patient, um, we figured that was probably ultimately the cause. Sarcoidosis can also leave you with these nice, these nice uh, granulomas in the nice calcified granulomas in the spleen. So here's another example of a kind of nasty looking spleen. And you can see that there's some target lesions there. And there's like all these small lesions. And of course, you should be thinking metastatic disease as they were with this spleen, but they they uh, took it out and it actually turned out to actually to be sarcoidosis. Um, so again, it's really difficult uh, to, to um, distinguish what these are by ultrasound and sometimes with other imaging as well. So an example of metastatic disease to the spleen. So this is not as common as metastatic disease to the liver, but one of the cancers that specifically likes to go here is ovarian cancer. Um, so you can see that there's been some hemorrhage and there's a uh, part of this looks cystic and then you can see the, um, the cancer infiltrating the splenic tissue. Okay, so this is a patient that I think we probably all ultrasounded um, a number of years ago, probably during the summer that she was here because she kept coming back with left upper quadrant pain. And so you can see the spleen and you can see that there's this area of demarcation and the upper pole of the spleen is really kind of anechoic looking. And it's kind of changed over time and become more anechoic looking. And there's actually no blood flow there. And that's because this piece of the spleen has actually been cauterized. So the blood vessel to that portion of the spleen uh, is no longer functioning and that spleen is dead. So you can see that there's this nice area of spleen that's actually okay, but up here, the upper pole, the spleen is not okay. Um, so she never had any more bleeding or anything, but, but uh, she kept returning and we would image. So you can see this nice area of infarct in the upper pole of the spleen. And this is another example of a perisplenic window. And you're scanning through and you're thinking, wait, 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 what's going on here? So in the middle of the sandwich, I have this hyperechoic sort of homogeneous tissue. At the top of the sandwich, I have a hypoechoic tissue and it seems to have some vessels running through it more than the hyperechoic region. And then below that, I have a kidney and that one I'm sure I can identify. So what's going on here? Well, it's actually the liver is so large that it's coming over the top of the spleen. So this is an example of hepatomegaly um, and it's, it's crossing over and pushing the spleen down underneath the diaphragm. So um, don't be surprised if you see this, um, especially if you're measuring a liver and it's very large, it may may extend all the way over and cross over the top of the spleen. And of course, another thing to consider when you're looking at the spleen is, you know, make sure that you're not looking at the stomach and thinking that that's a lesion inside the spleen because it's just a bunch of air uh, in your stomach, which is probably full of liquid as well. So the spleen, it's homogeneous, less vessels in it, uh, less than 13 centimeters in length, less than six centimeters in depth or thickness. Um, splenomegaly is pretty common um, with when, when associated with CHF, portal hypertension. You can see it with infiltration from leukemia and lymphoma, also hepatitis, mononucleosis can cause it, um, and sometimes other infections or hemolytic anemia. You can also see this with glycogen storage disease, uh, malaria, or something called myelofibrosis. And we talked about extra splenic tissue, splenules and splenosis. So splenules are those nice, um, nice uh, splenules outside of the, the spleen. And then the splenosis is where you get 
splenic tissue embedded along the peritoneum, and awfully, often that is post-traumatic. The cystic lesions can be kind of a lot of things, but congenital cystic lesions are much less common in the spleen than they are in the liver. And don't forget your vascular lesions can mimic a cystic lesion, so use some, use some Doppler. And then the solid lesions in your spleen have a really wide differential. And don't, don't misinterpret hepatomegaly or air in the stomach um, in your left upper quadrant window. And the take home point is that whenever you're looking at gallbladders, when you're doing your fast exams, take a look through the liver and the spleen um, because you might actually find something that will save somebody's life. Um, so if you do see something unusual, get additional imaging or follow-up. Uh, it's required for most lesions, but also check to make sure that if they had this on their prior imaging studies that, that uh, you have found that out, you don't send somebody for imaging that they do not need. Okay, so we went through the liver and the spleen. We looked at the normal. We looked at some abnormals and kind of a differential and what to do with those. And so now I'm done. And I thank you for uh, listening and watching.